II program on law firm innovation. Jordan is a lawyer and a consultant, but also he really truly is a legal industry analyst. And it's, it does a lot of forecasting on the impact of changes to the profession. I think, I don't know how many of you read his Law 21 blog. Uh, it has been named for five straight years uh, in a row as one of the top 100 legal blogs in North America by the ABA Journal. It's just fabulous. I think his points are always right on point, very thoughtful, very provocative, and uh, I know I appreciate it. So Jordan's been able to share a lot of his views and trends and thoughts uh, with, with law societies, with state bars, with law firms, with law schools, with bar executives. So he really is out there all the time keeping his thumb on that pulse. He is a partner with global consulting firm Edge International and a senior consultant with STEM Legal Web Enterprises. Obviously, he's a, he's a fellow of, of our college and um, has been involved in a lot of other things. One of the things that was in your handouts, and I hope you all got a chance to look at it, and if you haven't, please do, Jordan just most recently uh, published through Maryland's Attorney at Work uh, site a, a document called Evolutionary Road, a Strategic Guide to Your Law Firm's Future. And for any of you touching the law firm space here, it is just a fabulous, short, succinct, but extremely well done piece with recommended steps for the kinds of questions and dialogue you can gauge in with the law firms in terms of these very issues. So with that, I, I again, very pleased to hand it over to Jordan. And there it goes. Sorry about that. Technology. So, um, of course, it's not technology. It's actually a person who lifts up the, the who actually lifts up the computer, unhooks the machine, and then blames. What's the old story? Uh, that's a poor craftsman blames his tools. I think is what we have here. Okay, I think that's almost everything except for this. Alrighty, Susan, thank you. That was an extremely kind introduction. Thank you very kindly. Thank you, everybody. Good afternoon. It is a huge pleasure to be with you today and to be addressing this audience on this topic. Thank you very much for the opportunity. The topic in particular, the topic is going to come up any second now. If you get a little closer, a little closer, it's going to come and there it is, law firm innovation. Law firm innovation. I think that right now that is the toughest job in professional law firm management, making that happen. Don't you think? I don't think there's, there's, a, there's a greater challenge going, going from the, the, the basic idea, right, of an innovation, but actually getting it to implementation, getting us to that whole process and making it successful, executing it properly, and then making it sustainable. That is a really tough job. And I think for a job that tough, I think we need to bring in as many big guns as we can, uh, the biggest cannons we can think of to help us figure out what we should do. So for me, that's South Park. Now, you may or may not be familiar with the show, and if you're not, I will take you briefly through one of, I think, their, their most uh, influential, for me, episodes, which referred to the underpants gnomes. <laughs> now, what the kids of South Park had come to realize was that underpants were disappearing from the, from the dresser drawers in the bedrooms of, of South Park. And they figured out that this was actually the work of a race of gnomes who lived underground. So they track down the gnomes in their underground lair and they confront them. And they say, essentially, why are you stealing the underpants of, of South Park? And the gnomes reply that this is actually part of a very sophisticated business plan that they have cooked up. And the kids are, of course, looking for, you know, some more information. I don't get it. Fells one, collect underpants. Fells two, fells three, profit. Oh, I get it. No, you don't, fat ass. Any resemblance between that and the law firm consulting process should be considered entirely spurious and cynical, but, but there you go. But, but you can see the point. The, the, the problem that we have when we talk about law firm innovation is very similar, right? We have the same basic flowchart issue. We have a great idea. We want to get it to execution, to implementation. How do we do that? That big old question mark in the middle, how do we get to that point? And that's what I hope to talk about today in the next uh, 20 minutes. I know it's supposed to be 15. I tried. It's, it's 20. Uh, is to talk about law firm innovation and, and to lay out for you what I think, anyway, are, are five 
critical steps and steps that as you get further down the road or maybe more accurately further up the mountain as it gets steeper become a lot more challenging. Now, by no means do I want to suggest that the five steps, the five ingredients that I'm going to lay out for you are exclusive and exhaustive, right? In fact, that's actually the whole point of the breakout sessions we're gonna have later on today, right? You know, because that's where you're gonna to get together and you're gonna identify from your own experiences what actually works, right? And how to get there. But I, I figure five will at least get us started, get the conversation rolling. Okay, so what are the five steps? Where do we start this journey? I think we start it with facts. Novel concept, I think, uh, in, in the legal market in many cases, or at least among law firms. And, and the reason it's novel is that, and I think many of us can appreciate this, a great deal of strategic planning and thinking that takes place within law firms is what you might call faith-based, you know, <laughs> fantasy-based. Uh, you know, it's, it's, well, strictly, strictly speaking, it's, it's based on assertion and opinion. Well, I think such and such, therefore we should do this, that, and the other thing. So I think what we can do to start off with is actual, verifiable, measurable information. And a, and a you know, hat tip to Renee, who I think is, is pushing in the, exactly the right direction. We've got enough stories. We've got enough legends about the law. Let's get some facts. Let's start answering some questions in law firms that every other industry in the world long ago figured was fairly basic stuff. What is our cost of doing business, right? And in very specific terms, what is our cost of delivering this particular type of service? How much did it cost us last year to service this client? Pick the client at random, right? And how much did that client give us? Is this client profitable, right? Never mind for the individual partners, right? Did the firm turn a profit on the client? If I asked your average law firm, pick 10 clients at random and tell me if they were profitable, I'm not sure the fir many firms would be able to do that. What do we actually sell? What is our inventory, right? And, and, and yes, absolutely, we, we sell and touches on, on some of the subjects this morning we talked about, value to clients, absolutely, but I'm talking about the actual tasks, the accomplishments that we do. What do we get paid for, right? I mean, some firms will do uh, task-based or, or task-based codes, mostly at the behest of their clients, but most of us don't know this. So, so we need this information for a couple of fairly clear reasons. The first is we need to be able to make an accurate diagnosis of what's going on with our firms. Because without that accurate diagnosis, we will not know the right way to go. And secondly, and maybe from a cultural point of view more importantly, we need to be able to deflect and defend and counter the faith-based assertions we're going to get from the partners. When the partner says, well, I think A, B, and C, and you can say, yeah, but this is a spreadsheet, and this is a fact, and we can start working in that direction. And, of course, you have to start with the data. You, have, you, you know, you can't get five or six months down the road and think, you know what, some metrics would be a good idea, right? You need to start at the, at the, at the start of the start. So I think once you've got your facts, the next thing you're going to need here is a catalyst. Because as the subhead suggests, um, there are very few law firms, and Riverview, I think, is, a, is a, a noble exception. There are very few law firms in which the lawyers tend to spontaneously say, you know what, maybe we could do what we do a little bit differently, a little bit better. Let's give that a shot, right? Most firms don't do that. Lawyers don't do that. If you're of a scientific bent, you can appreciate what I mean when I say that lawyers are steady state. Law firms are steady state. Right? They tend to be fairly self-contained units, sealed off from the larger environment, and it takes a fairly substantial outside force to intervene and shake up and break through that shell. Now, the good news from our point of view, bad news from almost everyone else's, but the good news from our point of view is that we have a, a, a penalty of catalysts to choose from, right? Revenue is down. Profits are nosediving. A key partner has defected. An important client has left. Whatever, pick. You know, you have your, you have your choice here. The mayor of this fine city that is hosting us this weekend, back when he had another job, White House Chief of Staff, famously said, in another context which actually has some political relevance right now, he said, a crisis is a terrible thing to waste. And I think that's true. I'll also say this. If you are going to exploit a crisis in order to do something big, you better get it right the first time, 
because you're not going to get a second shot at it, and the amount of damage you could do by not executing it properly, not just in the current circumstances, but going down the road for future opportunities, is substantial. After we've got a catalyst, I think then we come to a point that many lawyers tend to, I don't want to say struggle with necessarily, just have a certain amount of um, contempt, I think is the word, is a process. And, and I can say process, if my American friends here would say process. Actually, I'm in Chicago, I can say process. Is that, is that okay, process? I'm an admission from Gad. Um, and, and I love the fact that we are, you know, I, I'm in front of a group here where I can put that image up on the screen and people say, oh yeah, I can, sure. Because yeah. I can tell you it's a rare audience that, uh, that I speak to that can, that can do that. But, uh, but as you can imagine, if I'm putting up the Gantt chart, then I'm, I'm invoking the spirit of legal project management, right? Uh, as, as I think an excellent blueprint for being able to say to the firm in a very clear and transparent and structured way, look, this is our idea. Over here is the implementation. That's our goal, okay? These are the steps we're going to follow to get to that goal. These are the milestones that accompany it, okay? This is the timeline. This is the budget. These are the people, kind of important, who are going to be doing all this stuff. And this is how we test if we know that we're actually staying on the rails or we're going off track, okay? And, and I think the way to look at it is that think of this as the most important client project you could undertake because in a way, from your firm's point of view, I think it kind of is. So those are the first three. And I think to a certain extent, a lot of firms can, you know, to a greater or lesser extent, can summon what's required to pull that off. The next two, higher up at the mountain, it gets a lot harder. The next one for me is leadership. And I think that if there is anything that we are desperately short on right now in the, in the private practice of law, in firms of all kinds, it's this. And, and I, when I talk about leadership, I'm not talking about your, you know, your managing partners or your CEOs, because as a general rule, I think these are the people who, they do get it, right? They have the inclination and the skills to lead, and they're also kind of tuned in to the whole, uh, the big picture. That's why they're in those jobs. A lot of the time, I think, the problem presents itself, and many of you can probably attest to this, at, if you will, the, the, the more formal leadership levels. The practice group, the industry groups, the, or in smaller firms, the, the particularly heavyweight partner, uh, the, the corner office, uh, well, you know, pick your simian of, of, of choice. Um, these are the people who have the, the, the power. And I think that what you need to be able to do if you're going to drive innovation forward is you've got to get rid of them. You've got to get them out of those positions because you cannot allow them to lead you into battle. Okay? And, and, and to my mind, I look at this, how do you do that? Well, you could buy them off. I find money works wonders with lawyers. It's give them a huge bonus to, to step down, you know, or to, to retire the position. We'll give you this, this parking bonus. Give them a title. Lawyers love titles. Right? Strategic counsel to our firm, uh, you know, chair emeritus, you know, have fun, make ones up, whatever. But the idea is, however you can, over the course of time, but as fast as you can, get people into those positions who have ideally the skills and the inclination to lead, but also are going to be with the program, okay? Because with leadership comes really important things like accountability and enforceability and execution to the plan, right? Because that's where it comes in, that, that's where it all happens. Without that, without the level of leadership to make sure those things happen, you're gonna run aground. Which brings me to the fifth, and I think, in a lot of ways, not just the toughest, but also the, the element that, to my mind at least, almost sums everything else up. That if you have this next one, if you have nothing else, at least I think you're out to a great start. And that's courage. It's just flat out courage. Photo by Felix Baumgartner, lyrics by Billy Joel, which I think is a fairly new combination. Courage lies at the heart of a firm's decision, a firm's willingness not just to pick a course, but to stay the course and to see it through. And, and many of us, when we talk about leadership and courage in firms, we almost just throw our hands up and said, okay, well, we have now officially entered the realm of fantasy. We're back to faith-based thinking. I appreciate that, I understand it. 
But the question we have to ask is a question from one of my favorite Chicago-based movies, The Untouchables, when fairly early in the movie, Sean Connery's beat cop says to Kevin Costner's Elliot Ness on the subject of how you take down Al Capone, he says, point blank, what are you prepared to do? And that's the question that every single law firm has to ask itself right now and answer, okay? Because as soon as you try, not even like to get this started, but as soon as it starts to kick in, you're going to get, as we all know, tremendous resistance. And we know what it looks like, it's complaints and it's criticisms and it's little tantrums that they throw, right? And, and, and we're all familiar with it. So what I tend to say to people who are in a position to say, I want to drive an innovation forward, I said, stop, fast forward, six months down the road, okay? Six months down the road, your innovation has launched, everything's fine, now it's starting, you know, the claws are starting to dig a little bit, you know? We're starting to actually feel the squeeze of the vice grip. And into your office comes an important partner. And he closes the door. And he says, I want to make something clear. You can have all the innovations you like here. You can have all the fun and games that you desire. But not in my practice. Not in my department. And if you try this, if you push me on this, I will be out the door across the street to that rival firm so fast with five of our top clients. And the first you'll hear about it is when you get their press release. That's a dramatic expression of it, but that is fundamentally the threat, implicit or explicit, that every single law firm that I've talked to who, about innovation and that all of you, I suspect, have run into at some point as well, you, it's there. It's, that's the problem. That's the issue. And we also know what, in most cases, the response is going to be. The response is something like, I understand. I, I know this is difficult. It's uncomfortable. Uh, we will exempt you and your department from this process. At which point to say, you might as well never even have started. It would have been better had you not launched this because you have wasted so much time and energy and sweat equity and credibility and it has come crashing down because you failed at the moment of truth. And I appreciate, totally appreciate, the incredible cultural political pressures that lie behind it. I never said this was going to be easy. But I think when that question gets asked, or that statement gets made to the, to the person leading the innovation, whether that's the managing partner, or the, maybe the poor schlub who's, got, who's in charge of actually making this happen, whatever, but when, when, that, when that threat, let's call it what it is, is made, to my mind, I think the response was something like this. I would like to say thank you for letting me know about this. Thank you for your contributions to our firm and to our clients and the value you have given. We are a team here. We really are. And we want you to be part of our team. But if that's not what you'd like to do, you do not have to wait until tomorrow. You can leave right now. Right? That's got to be the only answer. If you are going to stand up for the firm, if we are all going to stand up for the firm, that's the response we have to give. And we know, like, that's, it's the impossible answer. It's the, you know, you, don't be silly, you can't do that. Because you know the other partners will come streaming into the office, you know, saying, no, no, no. And, and they, they don't like the partner either, right? But they'll come streaming and they say, no, no, no. You, you know, he's, he's got all these clients, he brings in all this money. You, you know, you, you've got to find a way to keep him here. And the answer to that is, he has never even been here, truly. He has been using our firm and our letterhead and our goodwill as his own personal platform for financial advancement and ego gratification for a long time, okay? And, and if he doesn't go today over this, he'll go next week over something else when he throws, uh, as they would say in, in Great Britain, when he throws his toys out of the pram, right? Or he'll go six months from now when that other firm actually does scrape the money up together to make a lateral hire, or he'll go when he retires having mentored nobody and passed on his practice to no other partners and you lose a client anyway. If we're gonna lose this guy or this lady or this person, whoever the case might be, if we're gonna lose them, let's lose them on our terms. Not on his, not on hers. Anyway, rant over. <laughs> Moment of truth. And I think if you're gonna start any kind of innovation in a way, like I say, fast forward, get to that last point and ask yourself, what am I going to say when that comes up? And if, if the answer is, honestly, I'm going to cave, then oh, hold off. 
truly. Press the pause button. Do what you need to do to arrange things in terms of your, your leadership and your structure and whatever else happens to give yourself a fighting chance you will actually give the right answer and you'll get the support you need from within the, the rest of the firm. But if you're ready for that moment, not only will it be successful, it's going to be a lot of fun. Okay, uh, got about five minutes. And in five minutes, I'm going to try to take you through uh, two, two minutes, two minutes. I'm going to take you quickly through, um, <laughs> in the materials, I put together a list of 20 law firms and legal entities uh, that I think we're doing some extremely interesting stuff. Riverview is actually one of them. Very quickly, just going to talk about what I consider to be success stories. And the reason that I want to mention them to you is that they, they run the gamut from large international law firms to small, solo-driven, online-based projects. Okay? And almost all of them, I think, will be familiar to you to a greater or lesser extent. Littler Mendelssohn, right? I'm sure you've all been following the things that Littler is doing. Um, their, their, their dedication to systems and processes to reduce, not just to reduce and streamline their internal costs, but to increase the quality of the work that they're doing, right? This is a thing that doesn't get talked about often enough. It's not just a matter of you streamline because you can cut costs. You streamline and create systems and processes because it makes you better at what you do, okay? And, you know, global, they've just expanded out of South America. Uh, mentioned earlier, Cypherth. Right? We, you know, we, Cypherth is here with us today, no need to talk about it. In a great extent, the point I want to make about Cypherth, which I think is really cool, is that last bullet point, that uh, they have essentially taken what was originally intended to be an internal process, and they have turned it around and made it external, client-facing, business development producing. They now provide consulting services in Lean Six Sigma to their clients. That's awesome. That is so cool. Third firm, I, I could have gone with either one or decided, Pat, because I know you're already uh, here and we, we know you, but to make the point, the Summit Law Group and Valorum Law Group. I, you know, the, the two, I think, extraordinary practitioners of this, the value adjustment line, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, the idea that at the end of the, uh, the, the retainer or the assignment, there's a little line on the invoice that says you may add or subtract or would make whatever changes you want to the final bill to reflect the value we provided. That's astonishing. I think, I honestly, I think that's the biggest, most courageous innovation I've ever seen a, a law firm do. How much confidence must you have in your own products and services to make that promise? How much faith and trust must you have in your clients? If every law firm had that level of confidence and faith, we wouldn't even be here having, having this discussion. So just awesome, awesome things. Going down smaller, uh, the Justice Cafe in Atlanta, a small firm that recognized family law clients were unable to, to access most of their services, recognized new graduates were being in a position they were unable to get work and experience. They combined the two this amazing innovative solution called the Justice Cafe. Look it up online. It's based in Atlanta. It's totally cool. And when you're online, uh, surf over and take a look at wevorse.com. And, and again, this is a one family lawyer who recognized that it was, it's not working, and it's not. Family law is not working. It is utterly broken. And she said, what if we designed uh, a solution for people in a, in a divorce situation that was fixed fee, that was uh, accessible and affordable 24-7, online-based, multidisciplinary, and that focused on the actual needs of the people at hand? And that's what she came up with, wevorse.com. Uh, there are days when I think that's the future of family law. That might be the future of a whole kinds of different law. Okay, I have, I, I was given two, I did four, I apologize. I will wrap up. I will simply say those are my five nominees for uh, the steps that you need to get to that stage. Uh, when we have our breakout sessions after the, the breakout sessions after the break, then that's where we really pull on and draw upon your own experiences, figure out which of these makes sense to you. In your own experience, what have you seen that has worked? Come back and describe the innovations for us, okay? Or describe the innovations that you think could work, either one, okay? But then tell us what are the principles? How does it actually happen? Because that's what the profession badly needs. The profession needs the precedent, they need the example, and need the leadership, and I think we can provide that today. Thank you very much.